Cancer is one of the scariest words in the English language. If you haven't experienced it, you likely know someone who has. My guest today not only survived it, she has a miraculous story to tell. Annie, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So tell me how this started. You started having some pain and you didn't know what yeah. was happening. Yeah, exactly. I was having pain um, like in my stomach and uh, severe enough that um, I was having shooting pains going down my leg. I was having trouble standing upright um, and it ha came on quite quickly. Um, but before that I was having um, a lot of issues with uh, my stomach just looking distended. So when the pain set in um, I knew that there was something going on basically. And, be, and your roommate was teasing you about being pregnant. I mean, you were like not a little distended. Like she, you were trying to do sit-ups, like everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was exercising. I was doing all these things. My roommate would come over and poke at my tummy and be like, you look pregnant. So <laughs> Nice roommate. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So nothing was helping, though. Nothing was helping, you know. I mean, as far as exercise goes, I was seeing results in other areas. But, um, but my stomach was not, it was actually getting bigger. So you ended up in this incredible pain in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I know it was really rough. Tell me what happened. Yeah, so you know, I was uh, in and out of the hospital, um, basically just begging them to do something because I was, yeah, just in so much agony. And uh, at the hospital, they ran a number of tests. They did uh, different scans. And, um, and they were even just like, just poking and just like prodding at my stomach. And, um, and yeah, they confirmed that that there were three large masses um, in my lower abdominal that um, there was one on each ovary and then uh, one on my uterus as well. Each of them were nine to 11 centimeters. So they could actually feel them as they mm -hmm. were examining you even. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I was laying out on the stretcher and they were actually, they were poking my tummy and you know, they were doing this and like measuring. You could see they were measuring uh, just with their fingers. They could feel the masses. Wow, so mm -hmm. you're diagnosed with these masses, but they don't actually tell you it's cancer. Tell me <laughs> no. about that. Yeah, so that was kind of bizarre, to say the least. Um, the, the hospital was adamant that they did not want to do the surgery right away because they specifically wanted oncology to uh, do the surgery. Um, but then they kind of tried to downplay that and they said, oh, well, you know, oncology is just because they're, you know, more specialized with, uh, with masses. And it wasn't until I received um, a package in the mail from the Cross Cancer Institute that had all of these brochures and all, these, all this mail out stuff about um, how to cope with ovarian and uterine cancer. And that's kind of how I found out. Oh my goodness. And yeah. they, the surgery that they wanted to do was fairly serious, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was one of the things is that um, they wanted to do an exploratory surgery, so with you know a long incision, as opposed to um, laparoscopic. Yeah, so they specifically wanted to do an exploratory surgery because they wanted to make sure that they got all of the cancer, and at that point, finally, the surgeon confirmed that yes, it was cancer. You wouldn't be at the Cross Cancer Institute if we th if we thought you had anything besides cancer. So yeah, they wanted to do an exploratory surgery, um, which would have likely involved a hysterectomy, um, possibly removing part of my colon, and um, just um, what they call staging, which is you know removing any tissue or any parts of organs that may have been affected by the cancer and uh, where the cancer may have spread. So you just didn't know what was going to happen. Exactly, and that's what was really kind of scary was that um, they told me they wouldn't know until after the surgery what I would need as far as um, additional surgeries or uh, chemo or radiation, any other treatments. So how are you spiritually processing this? Because you're very young to mm -hmm. have cancer and you're facing this, how are you processing that diagnosis? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I really was, to be honest. Um, I was kind of in denial. It wasn't really until I got that mail out, you know, that said, you know, that I had cancer. Um, but in the meantime, my mom was on social media and was contacting everybody that she knew to ask uh, for prayers. And, um, and 
I had a number of relatives who were contacting different people, including uh, I had a great aunt who contacted Huntley, 100 Huntley Street and asked uh, for me to be put on the prayer chain. On our prayer, they, she called her prayer line, so it's good to know we had a little role in praying for you as you went through this. Absolutely, absolutely, and yeah, it was uh, the weekend before my surgery, um, I started finding out that there was all these friends, acquaintances, and you know, even just friends of friends from all around the world um, that had heard what was going on, they were all praying for me. Okay, so the morning of your surgery, mm -hmm. you wake up and something is different. What happened? Yeah, it was so bizarre. So that was the first morning I woke up and my stomach was not looking bloated. Um, I was able to stand up straight without any pain. I was able to move around my house without having to take any painkillers. And, um, and even like I didn't have like shooting pain down my legs. Um, I was able to lay on my side without feeling that stuff was, you know, moving around my ribs because it had gotten to the point where if I would lay on my side, um, it felt like there wasn't enough room inside of me. And I had no shortness of breath for the first time in a number of weeks. Wow. So, so and, what did you think was happening at that point? Yeah, well, I had honestly, I had kind of chalked it up to that weird feeling of when you go to the doctors and suddenly you feel fine and then it's not until you go home again that all the symptoms hit. Right. So I kind of thought, okay, well, that's probably what this is. But at the same time, I was also thinking like, I did have a lot of people praying for me and I wonder if I even need this surgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But you show up for the surgery anyway. The surgery mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. So now you're in the recovery room. What mm -hmm. do they tell you? Yeah, so that was, um, that was the part that I was dreading the most was just that fear because I wasn't going to know until I came out of surgery what the next steps were going to be. So yeah, as I was in the recovery room and I was coming to, um, my mom, my whole family was around me and my mom told me that I got a miracle. And she told me that um, the surgeons opened me up expecting three large tumors and instead uh, all they found was one single fibroid, which is completely naturally occurring, is nothing to be alarmed about. And um, yeah, so there should have, what we had been told and what all the tests showed was, you know, a large tumor on each ovary plus one on my uterus. Um, there was nothing on my ovaries. And in fact, um, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome a number of years ago, and I had had a number of ultrasounds over the years that all confirmed um, the wording was always, yeah, numerous cysts on each ovary. And the surgeons couldn't find any cysts on my ovaries. They couldn't find any scarring, like any damage to my oh. ovaries from all of that. And yeah, and I mean, certainly no tumors. And then just this, ordinary fibroid that they were kind of like, well, we're in here anyways, we might as well take that out. But that's really all they had to do. So tell me about these conversations with doctors, because they don't like the unexpected in a way. And were they <laughs> admitting that this could be a miracle? Yeah, they were. Some of them were admitting it very reluctantly. <laughs> Some were saying, well, I don't believe in miracles, but yes, there is no medical explanation for that. Because that was something that was really important to me was that I wanted, I wanted to be able to say that I had had a, a miracle that could be backed up by science, that wouldn't be undone by someone coming and saying, well, actually, you know, this is actually what happened. And so, you know, every nurse that came in the room, every doctor that came in the room, we all told them what had happened. We asked them, is there any scientific or medical explanation for this? Mm -hmm. And all of them, they would try to come up with an explanation. Like they would be like, well, maybe you fell. And I'd be like, nope didn't fall. Oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe it was cramps from your period. Nope, it wasn't that, you know? So wow. like whatever explanations they tried to come up with, it was, I could tell them right away that that's not what it was. So, so here's what I love about your story, mm -hmm. because you weren't necessarily totally sure about healing. Mm -hmm. uh, you weren't hundred percent even really believing for a miracle. Mm -hmm. So tell me about how this has changed your view of healing and, and the power of God. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you read about healings in the New Testament, and I had just sort of thought, okay, well, I guess it happened back then, but um, I didn't know that I really believed that it could happen now. And there was a lot of times where I would hear, I would hear about someone else being healed, and I would kind of wonder, like, okay, but 
what actually happened. You know, like if yeah, if I were skeptic. to exactly if I were to talk to a doctor, what would they say? Would ha what would they say had happened? So yeah, it really just confirmed for me that you know, that miracles still do happen today. And I mean, really all I had was just a literal mustard seed of faith, you know? Just my mom saying, well, I have people praying for you and me being like, okay, cool. I mean, yeah, if that works, then great. <laughs> so uh, just 30 seconds left, how mm -hmm. does this change how you see God? Uh, it's really, it's kind of done away with my legalistic view. I used to think that, you know, oh, well, if, if something miraculous happens, you have to be good enough to earn it. Mm. And now I just, it's just fleshed out for me how perfect God is. It has nothing to do with, you know, your, your imperfections or your perceived perfections. It's really just all about how perfect God is. Mm, such a good word. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing your story. Thanks very much.